In this episode of Dilse, we're going to talk about India's foreign policy. We are supposed to be the wish guru of the world. Experts believe that our foreign policy or any country's foreign policy depends a lot on the economic power that the country has. And on the basis of that, you get muscle power in foreign policy. And a lot of experts have tied up the domestic issues that are happening in any country with its foreign policy policy postures. We're going to discuss these issues today with two of perhaps the most uh, prominent, accomplished foreign service officers in this country, uh, Shri Sam Sharan, who has um, been our foreign secretary uh, for two years from 2004 to 2006. He's been our ambassador to China. He's been the Sherpa of the government of the G8 plus G5 countries. He's been the chief negotiator in climate change issues. Um, and of course, he knows this part of the world that is our neighborhood exceptionally well. And we have another accomplished officer, foreign service officer, uh, Navtesh Sarna, who uh, was our ambassador to the United States from 2016 to 2018. He's been a high commissioner to the UK, he was an ambassador to uh, Israel, uh, and he knows, uh, is fully accomplished in all kinds of global issues. Apart from that, he's a prolific writer. He's written books of fiction, he's written uh, uh, translated uh, books, uh, and uh, I think he's published about 10 books. So let's start this conversation. Are we a wish guru? It depends on uh, what uh, definition you have of the wish <laughs> guru. Uh, you know, I don't think there is any doubt that at this particular point of time, uh, India is in some kind of a global sweet spot um, for various uh, reasons. Uh, it is a country which uh, in a global economy which is not really growing very much. Uh, the previous uh, engine of global growth, which is China, as you know, has been slowing down, is facing its own economic uh, headwinds. Um, so if you look at India's economic performance over the last several years, uh, I think it would be fair to say that even with a growth rate of about 6 to 7 percent, it sort of stands out amongst some uh, doubt that growth rate others. number uh, well that's uh, that's a matter of because you've changed that, uh, you've changed the basis no from 2004 uh, 5 to 2011 true, 12 but i would still say even if there are some doubts about what the exact rate of growth is there is no doubt that india is one of the uh, faster growing emerging economies maybe you wouldn't want to want to say fastest but it is certainly one of no, the no, no. faster ones. No, no, I'm, I'm looking at it from slightly differently. You're right. I think we're in a sweet spot. I think we have great opportunities. But a wish guru is one who influences policies around the world. Yes. Right? And I don't think that that can happen unless you are a big economic power, as China has shown. Right? Yes. So in that sense, you're right. I think Indian economy has done perhaps better than many other economies. But that's also because of our growing population. Remember? Uh, true. This, yes. Uh, right. true. So, so to that extent, you're right. Uh, let, me, let me just try and explain myself. Uh, even if the size of the Indian economy is not very large, um, and it is not growing at the rate that China was growing, I think the difference in terms of geopolitics and what is the nature of India's influence. I think you are today again seen as you were perhaps during the earlier period 2003 to 2007 as a country which was beginning to catch up with China. So it was reducing that you know, gap between the two countries. Right. Then that stopped. Mm. In fact, the, the gap started expanding again. Right. I think today 
reason why you are being looked at perhaps in a different perspective and a more positive perspective is because of once again you are seen as reducing that uh, gap and that is giving you a larger diplomatic space. So, um, in terms of influence, if not Vishwa Guru, not showing the way to others, but I think it would be fair to say uh, that uh, both for reasons of economy and secondly, because of the fact that today, as far as the major powers are concerned, the United States of America, or Western Europe, uh, for them, the greatest challenge is in fact China. No doubt. About and that. in that context, which is the country which has the scale, right. which is the country which has modest maybe at still, but has significant scientific and technological capabilities. And in terms of muscle power that you said, uh, there is no doubt that our military strength uh, is relatively speaking uh, also uh, growing. Certainly so for these done. reasons, I think uh, geopolitically, if you play your cards well, uh, then I think India can, in fact, uh, advance its position in the geopolitics. I'll take this uh, conversation forward, but I want to hear enough Tej on this. No, I, th I think what exactly what Ambassador Shamsaran said, if I can put it, come at it from a slightly different angle, I think there are three factors, more or less. One is our geography, uh, one is our demography, and one is our economy. Right. Uh, if not in actual achievement, in its potential. Correct. And its scale. Right. And given the conflicting position that's uh, the chaos in the world at the moment, mm. it's really every man for himself. Mm. Uh, and I think the world has come in away from any kind of rule based order or international uh, liberal post war order and all those things we used to talk about into naked geopolitical rivalries. Mm. And in that, we find ourselves. Uh, in a place where we are able to do, if for want of another word, a kind of arbitrage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we are trying to maximize our good relations with several countries and are to either to uh, uh, brace ourselves against a rising China or manage our maximum advantages from them. For instance, the United States. Now, our relationship with the United States has consistently grown over the last 30 years. Today, there is, in addition to our inherent uh, strategic convergence, there is a kind of shared uh, Vision. perception about China. Right. Uh, four years ago, five years ago, perhaps before Galwan, certainly we were not quite on the same wicket, mm -hmm. which explained why we were going slow in the quad. Right. Today, there is that strategic convergence. It may last, it may not last. Mm -hmm. But the basic uh, uh, ballast of the relationship should have been built up enough. Similarly, we have these, you know, we are triangulating various equations. You have Russia, US, India. You have India, US, China. And now, of course, the Middle East is opening up in a, in a very different way. So I think it is, it is a sweet spot. Uh, but ultimately, the test of the sweet spot should be how much good it does from where you started. How much good does it do to our own people? That's correct. Now, let me let me sort of on, on that, you know, st start a fresh conversation. You said that we're in a speech sweet spot, right? The gap between India and China is re is being reduced, right? But it's not being reduced because of the enormous, um, let us say, upswing in our economic fortunes. It's the enormous downswing in the fortunes of China. China is growing, as you know now, at the rate of 5.6 percent. Oh, yeah, 5.6 percent yeah. or whatever. China's uh, real estate market is in dumps, deep dumps. 70 percent of the assets of people in China are, invest, are in real estate. There's a 40% fall in the value of that, right? And uh, the market has, has gone down 60%. This is what's happening in China. So China therefore is softening its position even towards Taiwan and even towards the US. So it is not so much that we are closing the gap, it is the fortuitous circumstance of the fall of the Chinese economy 
right? And actually the bond market, they have defaulted in the bond market. So it is really the downturn in the Chinese economy that has resulted in the narrowing of the gap. That's number one. Number two, the sweet spot is because of the fact that China became a power to be reckoned with. And therefore, the United States and the Western world realized that they can't make all their investments in China. They were looking for an alternative, and the only alternative is India, which has huge possibilities. So the sweet spot is because of circumstances. The narrowing of the gap is because of the decline of the Chinese economy. I'm not saying that we're not in a sweet spot, but I don't think it is because of our own making that this has happened, but we should take advantage of this, yeah. right? This is my... Uh, my, my well, my, I, uh, up to a point, I agree with yeah. you uh, that uh, partly it is because of the relative positions have undergone some change. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is why India is being looked at in a somewhat different perspective than before. But I would still say that uh, if you look around the world, and particularly if you look around the emerging economies, mm -hmm. there is no doubt that over a period of time, India has maintained a reasonably high rate of growth of about 6 to 7 percent. You might uh, quibble about the exact well, percentage. I don't but, quibble. <laughs> uh, but, but I think uh, it is fair to say that yes, you have sir. maintained a certain right. uh, decent rate right, of growth. Right. But more importantly, uh, Navtej referred to, you know, the kind of turmoil which you see around the world. Right. The fact that we may be in that transition period between one global order and another global order. Um, now, in that kind of a situation where there is tremendous, wherever you look around, even within the United States, America itself, you see yes. that there is political uncertainty. Now, you may not like the present political dispensation in India. Uh, there are doubts about which way, uh, you know, this dispension is going. But I think it would be fair to say that whatever the nature of the dispensation, it has managed to provide in this period of great turmoil and change everywhere around us a certain kind of political stability which has become quite rare. No, not only that, we have been able to, um, in a sense, uh, have our presence felt in the world, right. let's put it, in terms of perception. Yes, so no, the no, perception, I, don't, I, I don't think we should doubt that. So there is perception outside yes. is yes. that yes. where everywhere is uncertainty, there is, there is change taking place right. and you don't know how that change is right. going to express itself. Correct. Here is a country which is a large player, it may not be the greatest player, but it is a large player. It has demonstrated a kind of political stability which is rather rare in the rest of the world. So if you take these two factors together, I think that explains why you are seeing yeah. not only potential, but a country which is in some sense realizing some of that potential. Up there? No, absolutely. And actually there are certain objective things which have happened over the years. And one of them is a slowly bettering of the climate for investment. Mm. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's not, we are not all there at the moment. Right. But still you find a fair amount of uh, infrastructural improvement, etc., which is encouraging countries to come. The second thing again, perhaps again is fortuitous, but again, I think we should be do, taking advantage of it and hopefully we are, was what happened to China during COVID. Mm -hmm. what the world realized that they had put too many eggs in the China basket. Right. There was a kind of watering down of the trust of China. Mm -hmm. This matched with Xi's a very aggressive and robust Correct. Uh, kind of uh, reactions all along their, their areas of particular interest. Now, when you put these two things together, a lot of corporates which had put everything into China are looking to move away. Right. Uh, they are trying. Vietnam has been a great beneficiary of that. That's right. But now what from people are saying is that Vietnam has reached its limits. Vietnam does not have the kind of scale that they, that they need. So India has, India has, and some things are moving. 
uh, this way. So again, we call it fortuitous, but then you know that's the way uh, that's what life is. That's, yeah, exactly, a lot of things exactly. come your way, when, and you have to be ready to. When history to, to gives you those it. opportunities, yes. you have to. And, you have to. and that that has happened, and yeah. that because of that, and because of essentially China's threat has become so high to the United States as a major competitor in every field, whether it is. In, in the maritime world, whether it is in trade, whether it is in an alternative worldview, whether it is in emerging technologies, there is a battle on between where the, what the future of the world is going to look like. There are two alternative viewpoints, worldviews emerging. That's correct. And India at the moment is, is, uh, has the potential and the capability to be an important partner uh, of uh, this, you know, a worldview which safeguards its own securities. Uh, you know, you're absolutely right and I agree with you. Um, we can have a different debate on the economy, which you said, no, the GDP, the numbers, the growth, the infrastructure, who is benefiting. I mean, I think you're right that the growth is, is there, but I call it the creamy layer growth. Yeah. Could be. Right. Yeah. And it's not the kind of growth that is in fact trickling down. Uh, India's poverty levels, uh, in fact, uh, you know, are, are pretty dismal. Uh, per, our per capita income, even amongst the BRICS countries, is the lowest. So we can't tom tom about, uh, you know, economic growth in the context of equity. But that's a separate discussion. I don't want to enter into that. But let's look at our neighborhood. Where we were in 2014, I remember at the inauguration, our neighbors came. Where are we now? China, because of its overpowering um, presence on the borders, its occupation of almost 404 lakh kilometers uh, of our area. Uh, it's our somewhat deteriorated relations with Nepal, our recent domestic policies right, are impacting our foreign relations. That's the point I started with. And uh, so where are we? Where we were in 2014, now where are we today amongst our neighbors? It's a very disturbing situation, if you ask me. So the good news is that I think whether it was the previous government or the current government recognized that the priority in our foreign policy has to be the neighborhood. Correct. If you can't get your neighborhood right, much else that you want to pursue will not See, be. There was a famous saying called love thy neighbor. It applies yeah. only. <laughs> yes. it, it doesn't yes. apply in foreign policy. Uh, no, it does not necessarily <laughs> apply in uh, foreign policy. It's but a I different think, definition of love. love. <laughs> <laughs> but it is certainly true that uh, I think that recognition has been there before and it has continued with this uh, government uh, as well. Uh, but the neighborhood is complicated. You know, there is no doubt about that. I think one of the things that you mentioned is, which is very important, is the impact of domestic politics yes. on foreign policy. Now, let me say that domestic politics will always impact it does, on it does. foreign policy. It does, it does. And yet, I think the distinction, important distinction is that you must not use foreign policy to influence domestic politics. That's correct. So, one, the, the, that equation is unavoidable, right. but the other part is avoidable. Right. Uh, and I think in one sense, that distinction has got somewhat blurred. Mm. That is, you play foreign policy so that you can influence what may Domestic be happening. Domestic politics. That is not an optimal way of pursuing foreign policy. So that is one challenge right. I think we have. Uh, second uh, challenge is that even though we say neighborhood first, mm -hmm. The problem all along has been that that has not been translated into what you actually deploy in terms of resources, in terms of even diplomatic manpower, Correct. you know, to nurture these relationships. Yeah. And these relationships are of a nature which cannot be pursued only at the official level That's right. or at the you know, top level. people to people. You, you, people to people is very important, but at the same time, at every level, you know, whether it is the 
parliaments, whether it is, you know, bureaucracy. Institutional. Uh, yes. All, at every level, you have to pursue these relationships and nurture these relationships. Right. What has happened, if you look at the history of our relationship with our neighbors, mostly it is episodic. Right. If a crisis occurs, you know, Indeed. we are all there. Yes. Crisis diminishes. Again, uh, it starts, you know, being put on the put on the uh, uh, shelf. Uh, so this is a, a structural issue, yes. and it needs to be addressed. Right. So uh, part of the reason why I think today we see that the neighborhood policy is not really delivering what it should, uh, with a few exceptions. You know, I mean, uh, we have done very well with Bangladesh, no doubt about that. Uh, we have continued to do rather well with Bhutan. And let me also say, which you mentioned, that uh, China has made inroads into our neighborhood. Uh, that is certainly true. Obviously, we cannot match the resources that China is able to bring to the table. Uh, we cannot do the same. But you know, it is a it is a mugs game to try and you know uh, always uh, try to catch up with China no, no, in no, that no, respect. Agree, so, agree. you have assets which China does not have. You mentioned people's to people relationship. You see the kind of strong cultural affinity which exists between uh, our uh, neighbors, neighbors and, us. and, and ourselves. And I think what we have not been able to do is to really translate that very density of people to people relations into a political asset, you know, in dealing with. We've not uh, concentrated on that, we made really no real efforts on that. Uh, we have not quite, you know, focused attention. Yes on how this can be actually turned to an advantage uh, for you. Lastly, I would say is the question of connectivity. Mm -hmm. Now, it is still true that the subcontinent is still not as connected as yeah. it was before partition. Now, that's uh, that's What happened to Sark? Uh, well, uh, Sark, uh, you know, uh, uh, partly it is also the impact of what I mentioned about yeah, the domestic yes, yes, uh, yeah. politics uh, because of uh, Pakistan. That's right. But uh, I think if what we, we also need to see is that one physical connectivity, there has been progress. Uh, no doubt about that in terms of, you know, highways, in That's terms right. of That's railway right. connections. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I always say that you may have a glass top highway mm -hmm. connecting you with your neighboring country. And yet, if at the border, you still have archaic kind of procedures That's and right. you still have many kinds of barriers. Right. You know, where are you going to get that what you are aiming for, which is a free flow of goods, of peoples and even ideas I because agree. of that cultural I, I affinity. Uh, so there are uh, there are many things which uh, we need to we need to really uh, look at in terms of our neighborhood, because I think it remains true that whatever ambitions you have to play a regional role in say Asia or even a larger global role, if you can't get your neighborhood right, right. it will always be suboptimal. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so part of the problem I had say with the uh, G20 summit, where you had a very successful initiative in calling the you know global south countries to get their you know inputs uh, you uh, i think won some brownie points yes, with getting course, african course. union in why and could you got a declaration which people were very skeptical right? about why could you not also give a certain promise to your own neighborhood as right. well yeah, as right. part and parcel of that it would have made a difference yeah. i think in again in amplification i, I think if i uh, there are possible Three points, I think, if I would add, many of them play into each other. Uh, one is, again, we, we've said a more robust China, etc. Now, we've never had that much Chinese activity as we have today oh, yeah. uh, in our neighborhood, mm -hmm. in as a direct competition. And this comp the second point, it's not just a competition with India or Indian interests. What's happening is this is no longer a you know, backwater as it was in the Cold Water years, mm -hmm. in the Cold War years. Today, you have the United States very much present in our neighborhood, though they tell India to take the lead. Mm -hmm. uh, India is the lead partner and they admitted to even yesterday, there was a statement to that effect by one of the assistant secretaries. But the fact is that American interests and Chinese interests are beginning to collide here in our neighborhood, whether it's Sri Lanka, whether it's Myanmar, 
uh, whether it's possibly Bangladesh. Even Nepal. Even Nepal. Nepal, yes. Even Nepal. And we're not even talking of Pakistan. That's right. So this again puts an objective sort of constraint on how much we are going to be able to do. It also should be more of a spur for us to do much more. That's because right. this is our, our direct, I mean, uh, backyard is not a good word, no. but this is our direct zone of interest. That's right. Without stability here, uh, we can't be developing. Absolutely. Without ensuring that our security interests are taken care of in the neighborhood, we will constantly be looking over our shoulder as to what's happening. That's right. And there is the third factor, again, which is complicating matters, is the internal politics of most of these countries today, which is being taken advantage of by one party or the other. Right. I mean, Myanmar, Myanmar is today a, a melting pot, and you don't know where it's going to go, what's going to happen to our and projects Sri Lanka there. is in economic doldrums. Sri drums. Lanka has <coughs> gone up and down and into China's lap and now trying, struggling to get out of. That's Maldives right. is now deep in China's lap. That's right. And they would rather not have 80 Indian soldiers but would put 37% uh, uh, of, uh, you know, their debt proportion is, is goes to China. That's right. And we are again not, talk, not even talking of Pakistan. So a lot of this puts an objective constraint. It also puts, uh, you know, the necessity that we have to, we cannot take any of these countries for granted. I mean, this is a very serious situation. I was just looking at the, in the context of domestic policy, influencing foreign policy. You take the recruitment of Gurkhas mm. in Nepal, mm. right? The Agnivi scheme, right, has had a very negative impact. True. Because yeah. there are about, I think, uh, 30,000 uh, Gurkhas serving in the army today, right? And there are people in Nepal living in pension who've retired to getting pensions from us. And suddenly you have a policy by Agnivir policy, by which that recruitment is in great jeopardy. And China has offered that let the Gurkhas come to us, offer Nepal. Mm -hmm. Australia has done the same thing. So you should have thought through your policy, this Agnivir policy, and how it's going to impact you. The camaraderie grows because of the interrelationship, mm -hmm. right? Because Nepal has an open border. Now that camaraderie, if you had focused on your neighborhood, you would have been able to actually secure uh, the neighborhood in such a way. But of course, China being there, it's, 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 it's acting as a, as a spoiler. This, this has happened even quite 370. Even quite 370. Actually, Kashmir is, it's the domestic policy of Kashmir that has resulted in the kind of things that are happening, the infiltration by Pakistan. Now, we're not willing to talk to Pakistan. In any case, there's no point talking to Pakistan today, considering that the situation that it is in. I don't think it will be able to get out of the mire that it has got itself into. Similarly, uh, Chinese investment in Hanban Tota, right, and all those things have muddied the waters. Now, we need to focus on our neighborhood. And that's what's coming out of this discussion. Yes. So, to be fair, uh, say uh, Sri Lanka. Mm. Mm. Um, I was uh, encouraged by the fact that uh, when Sri Lanka went into this deep economic crisis uh, and in fact China was shown up as not being really ready uh, to help, help uh, in the manner that was expected by the Sri Lankan government. Uh, India was very quick off the mark. Four billion dollar Yes. So we, we uh, I think, took advantage. Again, we were talking yeah, about yes, yes. how you, <laughs> you know, yeah. you should look at what possibilities uh, yes, come sir. up. Yes, and I think when this possibility came up to salvage some of our, you know, we were able to do that. We were able to uh, do that. So I was uh, just a, a couple of months ago. I was in Sri Lanka, mm. and I was struck by the very you know, significant change in sentiment That's right. uh, with regard to That's India. Right. Right. Now, of course, you have to uh, uh, take, that, uh, take that forward. But there is no doubt that there is now a certain wariness about engagement with China, which was not the case. If you recall, when China announced its Belt and Road Initiative, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor was its flagship project. That's correct. Now it's 
have you heard no no not at all <laughs> you're right. right you're right uh, so uh, part of the uh, backlash which you see because i think the pakistanis have been very disappointed yes. that in this economic crisis the kind of helping hand which they had expected from the iron brother uh, simply did not materialize right, right. You know? but we should take advantage of this right situation. so uh, this is what i'm i'm, I'm trying to uh, point out that with respect to even our neighborhood there are opportunities which have opened up because of other circumstances because china itself is facing uh, yeah. difficulty take for example uh, nepal yeah. nepal very shrewdly has told china yes you want to do these various uh, large scale ambitious project but you have to do them on grant that's right uh, they are they, uh, they have realize the experience <laughs> with other countries exactly so yeah. i think there are also opportunities in our neighborhood where we can actually uh, yeah. advance yeah, I, our I, 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 and, and there's a practical demonstration of the change in sentiment in sri lanka Ooh. they've put a one year moratorium yes. on visit of research ships mm. or in other words spice ships mm. Mm. Uh, essentially because we were not happy with the chinese uh, ships uh, visiting colombo and hamantota uh, and similarly i think if the other sort of good patch of news uh, is is the fact that in bangladesh i think except for the tista river issue we have actually got through a lot of major problems and connectivity things are being inaugurated almost as we speak so i think that is again a good story yeah, but i think bangladesh i think we are we have to take this forward again the domestic oh, politics uh, well, the domestic politics dom- is having an impact it's, it's, yeah. it is having like an impact imp- but i the think the fencing the migration all that is, is yeah, yeah. yeah but you know i think what you have to uh, keep in mind is that whatever short term opportunities emerge mm. in your relationship with say your neighbors you should utilize that opportunity to put into place longer term assets that's right yeah, yeah. i agree so that. once you put in those longer term assets take for example with bhutan mm. now the hydroelectric power relationship between the two countries yeah. is so important is right. so significant that even if there are certain political changes you know that provides a degree of you know of sometimes that happens even with nepal because true? same thing with nepal yeah, there is a vested interest yes. created yes so. and and with bangladesh today you would be surprised that india is today one of the largest suppliers of power that's right uh, to bangladesh that's right. its entire industry so that's what must move right. forward yeah, yeah. from a long term standpoint long term standpoint right i think this is this is the kind of strategy you need to have let's now move away from our neighborhood <laughs> and look at the us and look at what's happening in the indo pacific area especially the challenges that are lying ahead the us recently along with south korea and japan have entered into a military alliance which i think is very significant given the the hostility between japan and south korea because of the occupation from 1910 to 1945 so you have uh that happening you have the orcas happening where the uh, australia and the us and the uk okay. are getting together for uh, australian manufacturing uh, nuclear submarines to meet the challenges you have the quad uh, you know in which we are a significant partner but my question is when it comes to the crunch are they going to help us big time John Bis you, 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 like you can start you can you can start or anybody uh, you know i think i would say without any reservation yeah. that if you expect that any of your partners with whom you have strong strategic convergence yeah. will actually come and fight your wars yeah. that will not that's happen. right so i think that we should be absolutely clear, clear about. about short of that are they in a position to assist you to build up your capabilities yes. because that is what you need they may be in a position are they willing and going out of the way that, to do that you know that is a evolving relationship right. why do i say that because when i was foreign secretary even getting that first foundational agreement yeah between the two sides which was a very very difficult task today all all of them yes yes our foundational agreements have been done that's true you know the level of i think engagement between the 
security establishment, defense establishment of the US and of India. If you had asked me at the time when I was foreign secretary whether India US relations will reach this level, uh, you couldn't have, you couldn't I would have. not have, I would have said this is, this is not possible. That's true. But that has happened. So what is it, what is it that you should be doing? You should take advantage of the current preoccupation that the United States has with a certain global challenge it is confronting to try and leverage that That's right. or to build up your own capabilities. Correct. You should not depend upon the US to bail you out in, in, in meeting your threat, but you should use this. How can I over a period of time really build up my you know, economic capabilities, my technological capabilities, military capabilities? After all, isn't this what China did? <laughs> no, but China's strategy was somewhat different. Well, it, it, mean, it was. We can't, we can't replicate that. Strategy. Maybe not. Oh, yes. But the basic principle, China used, leveraged the US preoccupation with the Soviet threat at that time to really get the US to build up its own capabilities. Uh, so I think you are also in that, in a, a somewhat different context, you are in that position. So to expect that the US or any of your partners will fight side by side with you in a war with any adversary, that will not happen. No, I'm not talking about war at, at the moment. I'll, I'll, I'll take no. this forward later. No. I, I I think when you're talking of the Indo-Pacific, mm. it's I think it's not simply a question of uh, you know ganging up towards against China, uh, to put it brutally, because even on that aspect, we certainly have two challenges. We have a maritime challenge with yes, China, and yeah. we have a continental challenge with yeah. China. Now, on the continental challenge, uh, nobody's going to come and uh, fight a a battle. We have to do it ourselves. Yes. If we have built up enough trust, if we have built up enough cooperation through our maritime cooperation, through our cooperation in the Indo-Pacific, you will find much more cooperation in terms of building up opinion, in terms of intelligence sharing, in terms of putting uh, uh, political pressure and diplomatic pressure where needed, which may help us in other fields. In that, I think we have done over the last 10 years, 2008 onwards actually, where we our defense purchases were virtually zero from the United States, we've reached more than $20 billion. And as Ambassador Shamsaran said, all the foundational agreements have been done. We are regularly exercising with the United States in the largest exercises, highly specialized exercises. But I think the second aspect beyond this, beyond pure security, is the fact that the Indo-Pacific has become the focus of, of world activity now and in the coming future. Whether you see it in terms of trade, whether you see it in terms of energy, you see it in terms of uh, uh, digital connectivities. So that and, and other, other areas of cooperation, the emerging technologies, I mean the technology centers are moving here, this Taiwan, Japan, South Korea. Correct. So whether you see only the chip industry, I mean, the biggest chip industry in the world is in Taiwan, Taiwan followed correct. now by Japan and Korea and, <laughs> and, and well, we are still struggling to Korea, get They are still struggling. So the Indo-Pacific cooperation, the Quad, for instance, has several legs. And of course, the biggest is this, you know, strategic convergence on China, which we don't talk too much about. But there are all these other things. So which is, again, we have a window here. We no, have it's from a security standpoint, yes. Yes. But the question is, ultimately, and I started the conversation by asking that question. Will they help we us? Have to become, will they help us, number one. Number two, we have to become a major economic power. Right? Now, what steps are we taking to become that major economic power? You know very well that China spends are over $560 billion in research. R &D. In R&D alone, every year, the U.S. spends over 640 odd billion dollars in R&D. Right? Our spent is spend is about 45 billion dollars. Now, unless you produce produce IT, that's how you're going to become rich. And you talked about um, you know uh, China taking advantage of the situation. 
problem here is the whole, the Western world is moving towards artificial intelligence. And with 1.4 billion people in our country, if you use artificial intelligence in a big way, which will be done because industry cannot help it, what happens to the people who are crying for jobs? So the economic model of India must be in, should be different to make it a superpower. And no cooperation in the West is going to allow you to let that happen, right? Unless you have a model on the basis of which you move forward. Because artificial intelligence, industry will have to adopt. So where do we where, go from here? And that's know, the big question that I have. Uh, you know, I think uh, I would say that uh, there are different dimensions uh, to this economic advancement or uh, technological advancement which we see. Uh, because if you look at some aspects of that technology, digital technology, uh, actually India has used it to, in a sense, leapfrog in some areas of fintech, for example. Yes. You know? uh, and that uh, also has helped in terms of you know, distributing benefits to a larger to the service sector. Uh, it, has, it, has, it has helped. Uh, so it is, it is not that if we go in for this technology, it is necessarily going to worsen our employment uh, uh, problem. It may in some ways also help by making a bigger cake uh, possible. Uh, so we, it, it, is, it is something that we have to, as you said, we have to examine uh, yes, you know, very carefully. Uh, the um, other aspect is that the creamy layer argument that you are giving is absolutely right. So even if we are looking at, say, the uh, startup space, mm -hmm. uh, very dynamic. But very difficult times. Right. Yes. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is a very, very uh, you know, mixed kind of uh, picture. But the, the consolation is that this mixed picture is being faced by everybody. Yes. <laughs> it's not that. Uh, but it is also giving you, I think, giving you an opportunity for possible you know, leapfrogging. Uh, we have done that in some segments, as you've seen, you know, you are also associated with the whole idea of, you know, how do we make sure that we adopt a policy framework, which is not so much focused on revenue, but it is focused on how do I expand. Exactly. And it was eminently successful. That's right. So I think there are examples within our own country, which gives you the possibility of looking at what are the possible areas in which this kind of a technological capability can actually open up much more, much more opportunities uh, for you. Because basic ingredients are there. You, after all, have a very, very sophisticated uh, scientific and technological manpower available. After all, that is why so yeah, many absolutely. of the major companies are opening yeah, 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 their yeah, yeah. research uh, laboratories. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think the basic uh, potential is there. Unfortunately, we have to keep going back to the word potential. But uh, <laughs> it is, it is uh, there. Uh, so I would say that, uh, you know, I, I do not uh, think that, uh, you know, we should be somewhat inhibited in, in really going uh, full scale ahead. Uh, with respect to... Uh, no, we things. have to. We have no choice. And yeah. With ra regard to artificial intelligence, you might have seen a report today in the newspaper where several of the younger startup uh, you know, people are saying, you know, you are bringing in regulations which may very well support the bigger players, right, but what about us? Us, correct. You know? Absolutely. This morning. You, are, you might, you yes, might. I saw it. So those are complicated policy issues. You right. should not get into a situation <laughs> where you actually, uh, you know, shrink the space right. for that kind of uh, innovation. But artificial intelligence is going to help, and you're right, the service yeah. sector big time. Big time. And it, it, huge growth possibilities there, right? But that's not going to transform the economy of India, I, I, I fear. In, you need much more than that, is what I, I'm saying. I, I am a somewhat more optimistic on that, uh, on that count. Uh, because even with respect to manufacturing, you see in many parts of the world how artificial intelligence is actually leading to, you know, much more sophisticated manufacture, of course, but also making possible a scale that was not. Sorry, Navtej, I'm going to take the please, have please. An issue with him on that. <laughs> I am I'm willing to <laughs> listen uh, avidly. <laughs> yeah, the, the, reason, the reason why I'm saying is that unless you, unless you invest in education, 
unless you invest in skills of that point. nature, you're not going to reach I there. Agree. I agree. Right. Uh, STEM in India is yes. is, is yes. rather see, depressing. See, that's not happening. If you yeah. see our budgets I, on education, I, I, I concede that. Yes. I concede that. And that's uh, the point I was making. I, I uh, think that is probably one of the biggest challenges. Yes. The reason why I say this is that if you look at the Chinese experience, right. they lost a whole generation during the Cultural Revolution. Yes. Yes. What was the first important decision taken by education? Council? Education. That's right. You know, it was and the ten Chinese years. Ten years, we have not done anything for education. Uh, yes, I, 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 th I think we. Uh, I, I do agree that you have to put in much more yeah. of an effort in that direction. I take perhaps some encouragement from the fact that a large part of that very top level, you know, scientific and uh, technological uh, capability is. Lying outside. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's the problem. That's the if problem. If you are able to. And, and I, there's another issue. If you don't give freedom to educational institutions, don't give them, you know, play in the joints, you're not going to. This is not going to happen. This is a big, big issue that's, in this uh, country. Universities must always remain spaces for, you know, freedom of expression no, and they, freedom of. No, I, I think what we were talking about artificial intelligence and return to education, I think it's deeply linked. Yes. Because artificial intelligence is going to be based on this entire idea of greater computing, quantum computing, uh, you know, uh, larger... Machine learning. Uh, yes. And, and, and the United States, for instance, is now moving towards manufacturing yes. of chips, which yes. they have neglected yeah. for the last 50 years because they were designing, they're the top designers, that everything else except they are not manufacturing. And even there in the United States, they are in desperate need for thousands of people who are going to be able to work on the, that manufacturing, who are, who, and they are not going to be available in the United States. That's right. So again, we can fit in. We can't, we can't set up that manufacturing. We are planning to set up some, IT will belong some, to them. Some, some low, uh, you the know, IT will belong to them. The intellectual property, property. will belong yes. to them. Yes, yes. Is, but but we are. This is a way of getting into the uh, the value chain of artificial intelligence. We are going to set up a, I believe, a packaging and a testing uh, factory, which is right at the lower end of the value chain. We we cannot move straight into the manufacturing, but the training of people. Yes. And, and they permanently don't have to go and stay in the United States. As you've seen, there is a lot of mobility. Yeah. But this is going to be the strength of India. No, no. If I, we can do it. If we can do it. If yes. we can do it. So actually, there are so much more to talk about. Yeah. Foreign <laughs> policy is such a vast subject. We have touched, I think, on some major issues. And we're going to leave, uh, you, know, a, another, you know, another time for another discussion to take this forward. Well, thank you very much for being here. Okay. It's been very thank kind of you. 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 you to get two minds together, uh, you know, and to have a full free flow discussion is, is a great opportunity for, for me. Thank, thank you, you very much. And likewise thank you. for us. <laughs> thank you for thank getting you. us here. Thank, thank you. you.